Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Green Women's Declaration webinar. You're very welcome. We're here with our very special guest this evening, Sarah Fullimore, and it's uh, our webinar is about the Green Party governance, policy and law. And it's going to be a conversation with Councillor Jude English of the Green Party. And she is co-chair of Green Party Women, and she's going to be in conversation with Sarah Fullimore. Now, Sarah was called to the bar in 1994 and since 1999 has worked as a specialist family lawyer in chambers in London and Bristol. She specialises in all aspects of children's law and court of protection work. Sarah has extensive experience of public law proceedings and she represents local authorities, parents and children. Sarah is also an author and she is a, she is, um, a co founder of the campaign group Fair Cop. It's an absolute pleasure to have her here this evening. Before we do start the webinar, um, I do, just do want to let you all know it's a bit of a disclaimer, really, just to let you know that you may hear things that you don't like this evening. We are welcoming everybody and all views. And that means that you may hear things that you might find controversial or contentious, but the very point and the reason for our discussion this evening, and perhaps to a certain extent, the reason for the existence of the Green Women's Declaration is to say that we believe in the rights and the opportunities for people to have robust discussions about very important issues, many of which we will be discussing this evening. So we're not part of the Green Party, although we will be talking about the Green Party and some of its policies and actions this evening. Um, and as such, we're not an organisation associated with the Green Party. Um, but some of the things that we will be discussing here will be in opposition to Green Party policy. And anybody here who's participating in that as a member does so knowing that some of the things that we're talking about are against party policy. And that's, again, very much part of the reason of why we're here this evening. So then tonight, our two special guests are going to be talking about three very important legal rulings concerning discrimination of individuals for their gender critical views, those of Jay Phoenix, Rachel Mead and Shara Ali. In all three cases, the courts upheld that they were discriminated against according to the Equality Act. And whilst all three cases have very different settings, Jo was handed out of her post as an OU criminology lecturer. Um, Rachel was suspended from Social Work England, uh, which was their employee for expressing GC views. And of course, Shara Ali was removed as a Green Party spokesperson by Cheapex back in 2021. So they're very different rulings, but they are all important and do have something interesting to say for us um, about how they interplay with our gender critical views. That is the members of Green Women's Declaration who have gender critical views and with um, within the Green Party as well. So without further ado, then I'm going to be passing you over to Jude and Sarah. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Great. Thanks very much, Di, for that introduction and for just setting the background there. I'm really, really pleased to be talking with Sarah tonight. It's, it's something we've been hoping to do for a long time. And it's good that we can talk about these three really important cases and try to tie them into aspects of um of political parties in general, but particularly the Green Party. Most of us here have an interest in the Green Party, uh, whether because we're members some of the time and uh, that we are signed the Green, Part uh, Green Women's Declaration. So we're going to talk about the Rachel Mead case, which I know Sarah knows a great deal about and was part of. Um, and one of the reasons I want us to talk about that is because that was involved a council, Westminster Council, the Green Party sometimes seems to have a bit of a narrow viewpoint on things and not look outside itself too much. Now, the council was an employer and the councillors who sit on that council have a responsibility of public sector equality duty. So they should really understand about some of the detail of the case and, and what they what they did wrong, some mistakes that they made along the way. And I think there is a message there for all Green Party councillors who sit on local authority councils or county councils. So that's the reason I wanted to talk about that. The Phoenix case has a great deal to say about free speech. And there are a lot of similarities in a way between universities and political parties. They're places that should be open for free speech and academic debate and rigorous debate and stuff like that. And of course, the Ali case speaks very directly to some of the issues we've got in the party. So I wanted to start off, Sarah, with the, the Rachel Mead case. If you could just kind of give us a brief overview of what went on there, not everybody watching may know, and then some of the highlights of it, thanks. Yeah, not sure highlights is the word, but I think I know yeah. what you mean. 
I was involved at the Fitness to Practice Tribunal, which was Social Work England, basically saying that Rachel Mead um, could not be a social worker because of her appalling discriminatory views. What actually happened was that Rachel had a private Facebook group with about 40 friends. One of those friends was a trans identifying woman who took great exception to Rachel Mead posting newspaper articles, um, things from Fair Play for Women, um, links to crowdfunders, etc. So this person complained to Social Work England, who um, sanctioned Rachel. This all happened before the full starter judgment. So Rachel basically rolled over and said, I'm really, really sorry, please, I need to keep my job, I'll do whatever you want. Um, she was about to be re-educated when Force Starter won in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. So Rachel said, well, hang on a minute. Um, you know, what I've done is worthy of respect in a democratic society. Now, Social Work England, far from backing down at this point, doubled down. And you talked about highlights. Well, for me, the thing that really made my jaw hit the floor was when I was going through all the Social Work England documents preparing case for Rachel at the Fitness to Practice Tribunal. And in a document they prepared in July 2022, they said in terms that a gender recognition certificate changes your biological sex. Now, my blood ran cold. Remember, this is the regulator of social workers who deal with incredibly vulnerable children. Are those children being told by social workers they can change their biological sex if they undergo medical or surgical transition. Because if children are being told that, it is a scandal of gargantuan proportions. So I was really shocked. And I said to the tribunal, look, whatever happens, can we please just have a public declaration from Social Work England that this is bollocks? I may have used a more technical legal term. Um, Social Work England were represented by Robin Moira White, um, no such declaration was forthcoming. What they actually did, which I thought then and think now was incredibly dishonest, was said they didn't want to proceed against Rachel because they had new information. They didn't have any new information. All they relied on was things that they had known for years. For example, was this a private Facebook group? Yes, it was. Was Rachel posting as a social worker? No, she wasn't. Had anyone else complained? No, they hadn't. Had they bothered to look at the background of the complainant? No, they hadn't. Her Twitter feed was an absolute hot mess of discrimination and hatred for TERFs and hate groups. So it's like they all collectively lost their minds. And instead of um, standing up to the drubbing, which I really wanted to give them, they rolled over and I think quite dishonestly said, oh, because of all this new information that we've known about for ages, we're not going to proceed. So Rachel's fitness to practice is unimpaired. We have, we essentially back down, but without the embarrassment of you pointing out to us just how bigoted we've been. So Rachel got through that process, but of course she'd been suspended by Westminster City Council. So she took both Westminster City Council and Social Work England to the Employment Tribunal and she won a resounding victory. And even then, they would not back down and agree to pay her the damages that she so richly deserved. And they took her to a remedies hearing. Now, Rachel had to raise via crowdfunding I think nearly £200,000 and is some degree short of her target. I mean, this is insane. And I'm really, I, I don't think the remedies judgment's out yet, is it? Or hopefully, no, it's heard not. About it. But, you know, if, if she doesn't get an award at the absolute top end of the top bracket, something very wrong is going on. But what does worry me is even if she does get that, and I think she will, is it actually going to change their minds? Because what I think has happened is gender identity ideology acts as a virus and it eats the brain. There is no way anyone could have asserted that a gender recognition certificate changes your actual biology unless they had lost that part of their brain that controls rational thought and analysis. I do think what we're looking at is like a virus. I say it's akin to a religion. And I think it's it was Dawkins or Hitchens who said, yeah, religions are like viruses. They're things human beings need. We need things to believe in. And they are infectious and they are contagious. So it's just really, really troubling me that even while all of this was going on, for starter Mead, you see what the Green Party is doing and continues to do. None of these 
highly important and influential organizations seem to be able to learn about reality. So I, I want to tread a careful line tonight between being really quite terrified, but also quite hopeful because we are pushing back and we are winning in the courts. So hopefully that's sort of an overview of the Rachel okay. Mead. It, it is. Um, I'd like to just support your view that I think um, it's kind of a bit of a virus that's taken over our party, definitely. And the learning part's important. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to make this webinar in a way. We're hoping that people in governance positions and leadership in the party will watch it and be able to look at a different viewpoint from the one that they seem to get all the time. As far as I'm aware, nobody in the party's leadership or governance is discussing any of these cases, is looking at any of the legal stuff outside of our own kind of special bubble and is really, really setting the party, of course, which I'm a member, up for some really big um, problems in the future. So I think that's a very important um, aspect of it. So you say that Rachel won her case resoundingly and she will get big remedies, I'm sure, very shortly. Uh, one of the things I'd like to talk about in relation to the Green Party and, and, and the Rachel case, the Rachel Meese case, is one of the big findings was that the complaint system itself was harassment. Um, it was shown in the trial, wasn't it, the employment trial, that the use of the complaint system and the terrible years of of being left in limbo of not being given access to justice in the system was part of the punishment we've had a previous webinar that talked about the processes the punishment for some mm -hmm. of our own um colleagues who are trapped in a punishing system so could you just talk a bit more about what the judge said in that about the complaint system as harassment oh oh yeah and because nobody investigated the complainant not even a whisper of it it was just the one person who complained. The complaints were the usual florid hate groups, transphobia, bigotry, and it was simply taken at face value. That's because part of this virus, what it does is make people assume that any challenge or criticism of gender identity ideology is inherently wrong. Anything that you say that detracts from a man being able to declare himself a woman is akin to the most foul racism. I mean, I went through this myself with the police and my regulator. Yes. I suddenly, two years ago, was landed with a charge sheet, which was 29 utterly random tweets jumbled in from last year to two weeks ago. They couldn't even number them. And I, I made a, um, a data subject access request to the Bar Standards Board, and I got some fascinating email correspondence back. The reason it had taken them six months to pull together this frankly incompetent charge sheet was the poor woman tasked with doing it was emailing more senior colleagues going, I don't actually understand what she's saying. I don't understand what's going on here. What, what are these tweets? Because there was no filtering. There had been a complaint and it was assumed that I must therefore be this hideous bigot. So just a whole load of my tweets were vomited out on the page and I was told they made a course of conduct of reprehensible behaviour. And yeah, the process is the punishment. I'd been investigated secretly for a year. Once I finally knew, it took another year. It took the Free Speech Union funding me to have a conference with Peter Daly, writing to the BSB. And then, of course, John Holbrook very conveniently won his appeal about freedom of speech. But yes, of course, the process is the punishment. I think it's a very, you've got to, in a way, admire their strategies because they are very effective. Very few people are as belligerent and unpleasant as I am. And I fully own what I am. And it's been the best personality traits to have in this battle. Because if you do something like that to me, I get angry. And I start compiling very detailed chronologies. I start sending lots of angry emails. I start digging out all the case law. It, it's I'm the wrong sort of person to do that to. But I also accept that my personality traits are fairly rare, which is good because, you know, if, if everyone was like me, it would be absolutely hell on earth. And most people are devastated and frightened and are being threatened with loss of their jobs, their livelihoods, their reputation. So it's a very cunning strategy, isn't it? Just get people, terrify them, shut them up. I mean, it doesn't really matter if it ends up going to a tribunal, does it? I mean, Rachel was suspended for a year, happily on full pay. But what does that do to a social worker to be cast out of their job for a year? It's horrendous. I mean, the whole thing 
is absolutely scandalous. We've got to stop it because so much time and energy is being wasted. A member of Fair Cop has been keeping a spreadsheet and she estimates it's now about four and a half million pounds have been raised via crowdfunders to deal with this absolute nonsense. And of course, the real costs are much, much higher when it took me at least 50 hours to respond to my regulator's complaint over the course of a year. That's time that I could have been spending doing any, almost anything would have been a better use of my time. So, yeah, it's really, really troubles me that they've been given this weapon and they have used it to great effect. And it does seem to be taking a worryingly long time for these court decisions to filter down. I mean, even the Open University with Joe Phoenix, their initial reaction was not, we're so sorry we let this happen. It was, well, this is disappointing and we're going to consider an appeal. I mean, yeah. happily, they yeah. seem to quite quickly move away from that. But what an interesting first reaction when your own witnesses, I mean, that judgment was brutal. I have never seen a judgment like it. You know, it was the, the judicial equivalent of a good kicking outside the pub. And, and for any institution to read that and not think, oh, my goodness, what have we done? What have we become? I think it was very, uh, very yeah. interesting. Just to take it. Just to take a track back and say then from the point of view of this uh, webinar and our relationship with the complaint system in the Green Party, um, we know that recently there's been a lot of people being put on what's called no fault suspension or administrative suspension. And um, we've got Nathan Williams who's been put on a special sort of suspension because he whistled blow blowed um, our legal advice. We've got our, our very own Zoe being put on a, on a no fault suspension for whistleblowing to the HRC. And we know, actually, because we've started to do the scrutiny and oversight of the complaint system ourselves, as people in this group will know what I'm talking about, that we've been able to see that our complaint system has been weaponized in exactly this way and that people are being targeted, that procedures are not being followed, that the process is the punishment. Now, I know you're not a specific expert in, in, in this area of legal, but you are at the same time. So the complaint system of the Green Party is probably needs to be looked at very carefully and there will be something that will trip, trip them up in court, would you say? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that was the most difficult thing for me reading Shara's judgment. I thought, bloody hell, the acronyms, what seemed to be a very labyrinthine process. I didn't really understand all these offshoot groups which weren't members of the Green Party, yet they were. I mean, the questions of agency loomed large. It seemed to be very complex, and I'm sure that doesn't help. It has allowed, I think, an easier hijack, because it sounded to me like you really have to be on top of the procedures to realise just how badly they were being flouted. But at the end of the day, they were so poor, the procedural deficiencies were so evident. And I think the allegation was breaches of code of the conduct, wasn't it? But the code of conduct was never actually cited at yeah. the meeting in question. I mean, you know, this is basic, basic stuff. So it really is. It's all the more shocking that a political party which has set out, obviously, to try and impose good governance and have clear rules was able to simply rip up the rule book when it came to somebody whose beliefs they didn't like. And that sends a really chilling message because we've got, look, a social work regulator. We've got a political party. We've got the Open University. These are institutions of enormous power and influence, essential to the workings of democratic society. And they have been infiltrated and taken over in such obvious ways. I mean, it was a gross procedural breach, wasn't it, of the Green Party? Yeah. yeah. And, and I totally understand what the judgment is saying, that they could have got rid of Shirat if they'd done it properly. But yeah. such was their desire to get rid of him. So much of a non-human was he seen that procedure be damned. You know, they think they're morally righteous. And that is the most frightening thing, because people who think they're morally righteous never stop to examine their own motives and are actually encouraged to break the rules because they're doing the right thing. You know, who wouldn't go back in time and kill Hitler? <laughs> The whole thing is frightening because they're not just lazy or incompetent, but obviously that feeds into it as well. They think they are right. They think they are flying a flag of moral righteousness. And that, I think, explains why they seem to be so resistant, all of them, to accepting the judgments. I don't think Social Work England has accepted the judgment. The fact they wouldn't agree remedies with Rachel is very telling. 
I think the Open University have probably been one of the best. You know, they got their act together and they do seem to have responded sensibly. But the Green Party, of course, doesn't seem to have taken anything no. on. We'll, we'll come back to the Green Party again. So I think maybe it's time to just... Um, so Rachel, we see, you know, won her case resoundingly. It was Westminster Council, and I'm just going to reiterate this again for those in the audience as well to think about this. Um, and I've written to our CEO and governance leaders about this, that I am a councillor on a local authority that's hopefully going to win control of Bristol in the very near future, in less than 70 days. And one of the things I'm concerned with is that we don't seem to understand the law particularly well in this area. Um, and we don't want to be uh, responsible for making similar sorts of mistakes across the education sector, across social services, across social care. Anything that we control, we need to be fully aware as a, as a new governance group that um, this is something we need to take um, account of. Now, obviously, Bristol will have the, the advantage of having me in their cohort able to say, hang on a minute, I think you'll find the law on this is this, and I'm not uh, frightened to say it. Um, but we know that across the Green Party, there are lots of councillors who are very frightened to speak up. Um, so one of the things I'd like to ask you in relation to Rachel Mead, and it's a question that came in from our kind of, you know, please ask us a question, was what do you think Rachel's um, team, apart from the money, what will Rachel's team be asking Westminster Council to think about doing better at in the near future? Um, is that something you can kind of work out, yeah. what you would be asking like, yourself? I know you're closely allied with social work and are interested in it from your legal, your own legal training. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's it's saying anything impermissible to say that certainly Rachel is interested in what training is going to be put in place because the, they have lost their way so greatly. And one of the big reasons for that is that Stonewall and gendered intelligence and mermaids, etc., infiltrated training at an early stage. Because what you've got is the government basically washing its hands of this and saying, oh, it's all third sector stuff. We'll we'll contract it out. So, again, I have to admire them. It, it's been a brilliant strategy implemented, I think, over decades. But they've got in there and they've trained and it's cascaded down to the whole of an organisation. And I still don't think we have. I mean, there are pockets of individual good practice, good trainers, but Stonewall, Gendered Intelligence, Mermaids, etc., basically cornered the market and were able to plant very effectively the seeds which now grew into this suffocating ideology that we see. So it's going to be crucial. We, we can't just sit around and say how terrible it is. It is. Now we've got to build on the gains that we've made and there has to be better training. We have to see some group with the reap that Stonewall had. And I don't know if Sex Matters and the LGB Alliance could join forces, but we've got to have training. It's yeah. it's not people's fault. The law is complicated. I still don't understand the point about comparators. I had to read some of the paragraphs in Shara's judgment over and over again because it didn't make any bloody sense. And I'm an intelligent layperson with a legal background. So mm. I think if anything can come out of these discussions, that's what we need to be focusing on because people have been completely bamboozled. I mean, you see how sex is completely left off when anyone recites a list of the protected characteristics. They never say sex. They say gender or they say gender identity. Now, I know that Lady Haldane thinks that sex and gender are synonyms. She's wrong. They might have been even 10 years ago. They are not now. We need yeah. clear blue water between what is sex and what is gender identity. So all of these institutions need help. I mean, you've got, you've got, I think, some people who are deeply malicious, but most people just want to get on with their lives, do a good job and get some help in understanding how to apply the law. And the well has been utterly poisoned. Mm. So we have to do something to help them. Otherwise, it's we cannot keep up this law fair forever. We are all exhausted and it is expensive. And yeah. I know, you know, even putting in 20 quid for some people, that is more than they can afford. And they shouldn't bloody have to. This should be, where is the EHRC? Where is the government? This shouldn't be up to individuals. I think lawfare has got a shelf life just because it's so bloody exhausting and expensive. So let's try and deal with this by getting in at the grassroots and getting some proper training so that people understand the law and how to apply it. And really, we, we've got to do something to change the narrative. 
It is not bigoted or abusive or harassing or victimizing to believe that sex is real. It just is not. Yeah. And if we're telling men and women that they can change their sex, that is cruel and that is wrong. They can have whatever gender identity they wish, but they have to accept there are some places, some roles they will never have and they will never be allowed into. And it is doing them and us a greater harm to lie about it and especially to children. So that, I think, is what we, we need to get gender identity back in its box. Absolutely. You should never be abused or harassed or victimised. You want to be a goth, a punk. You want to have a, a mask presentation, femme. Knock yourselves out. That's great. But you cannot change your sex, and sex must remain the primary organising category. Well, for all the obvious reasons. We know as women, we cannot change our sex. We can't identify out of it. We are physically more vulnerable. That is the bottom line. So, yeah, I, that would be my word. Please, can we all try and pull together and try and get some national, nationwide training program that we can send in to try and undo the damage that's been done over decades. This is not going to be a quick piece of work. No, I appreciate it's not going to be a quick piece of work, but I do think um, it's interesting to think about why some of us who are in this party still are still in the fight. I remember speaking with Shira not so long ago, or maybe it was a couple of years ago, um, and talking about this and, and saying, one of the issues is we're a small party, we're, we're very vulnerable to take over. Um, and in another in another way, we're also, it might be easier for us to get ourselves out of this. So um, because we're small, maybe we can start the retraining. Um, I've, I've already written to the CEO and the head of governance to talk about what kind of training do we get. And I know that there are others in the party who will be taking a more stern view in the next few weeks, mm. I think, because we, we fully recognise that training is a really important issue. Of course, the party will say there's not enough money, there's not enough resource. I think one of the things we know is that they've not put enough money into governance generally or resourcing any of this. They're spending their money on winning elections and winning seats and not really thinking through the long term problems of having um, a proper governance yeah. structure and a proper training thing. So I think we'll just, you know, I know we're recording this and we'll, we'll have something that comes out of this meeting as well, which I think might be some kind of briefing paper, perhaps with Green Party women or with some of the other special interest groups who are now taking more of an interest in this. And one of the reasons they're taking more of an interest is because although for years it's been Green Party women who've been particularly attacked in the party, and we've seen Emma be attacked and have to take the, the party to court. We've seen Dawn be attacked and have to take the party to court. We've seen Alison Teal, the PPC for Sheffield, be attacked and probably going to take the party to court quite soon. We've seen um, Shirar be attacked and take the party to court. But we're also now seeing members of our seniors group, our, our more elder uh, group, be attacked for supposedly not following the rules. And we've also seen recently one of the members of the disability group being attacked. So the, the attacks are spreading to different parts of the organisation. But what that's also doing is waking up those parts of the organisation who've perhaps been a little bit shy or not really understanding what's happened to the women. Yeah. And now it's starting yeah. to happen to them. Um, there's going to be a little bit more of a resistance, I think. And in the next few days, we may see some important um, reports and documents coming out, which will help with that. So to give some people in the room who may be feeling a little bit like, oh, my God, it all sounds terrible. I think we are hopeful that there can be change. I'm going to switch now and say, let's um, try and talk a little bit about Jo Phoenix and um, her case. And, and the reason I think this is important to the Green Party is because Although when I've spoken with our CEO over the last year or so, one of the things that I've had come back is the kind of, oh, we don't need to worry about this from her, is, oh, because we're, we're not talking about employees, because most of us are volunteers, and so employment law doesn't really matter to us, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're, we're kind of special and different. One of the things that I did talk to her about early on is that we have a lot of a lot of similarity in a way with a university in that we're a membership organization um and our governance can be seen as kind of similar in a way uh, but also we've got this thing about free speech now what hellman said um in shara's case recently what i understood him to be saying was that there's a increased amount of freedom of speech inside a political party in a way that it's it's a more you've got to have more rough and tumble you've got to have the dirty mm -hmm. politics that he talked about and that yeah. it's a, it's a it's a higher bar 
if that's the right word for free speech, you should be allowed to debate and discuss things. And that, of course, is supposedly the same in, in the universities. Yeah, we think that the university should be placed for academia's you know, rigorous debate and for people to to talk about this stuff. And um, so I think that's why we as a party and particularly our governance people should be looking at this. I sent the CEO a copy of the Rheindorf report over a year ago which was the initial report that was done to say you you shouldn't be um, following Stonewall rules. <laughs> it's one of the things it says, that, if I remember correctly. And it yeah. also says you must allow gender critical spaces inside your organisation. It says that very clearly. If you shut them down, you will end up getting into trouble. So um, that was over a year ago that report was written, wasn't it? And then we've got Joe's case, which has taken a long time again to come through, has been incredibly personally difficult for her it's cost an extraordinary amount of money and it's very very disappointing to me personally because I used to work for them uh, that the Open University seemed to be swallowed by this particular virus and has gone down this route but um could you kind of give us a little bit of talk about about the freedom yeah, of speech I, I, the think, case? I think there's some important similarities and some important distinctions universities have a separate statutory obligation to protect freedom of speech political parties have a right to not entertain certain views. I mean, obviously, it'd be crazy if you said, I'm a member of the Green Party, but, you know, I really want nuclear power stations everywhere. So that's the tension and the difference. I mean, what I understood very clearly was he could be removed for his gender critical views because they go against a central plank, bizarrely. And I don't understand why the Green Party wants to make this any kind of a plank. I thought you were a party about sustaining making ecological change protecting the environment but anyway apparently the green party wants to say that trans women are women the green party wants to reject biology okay if that's something that the party's voted on in accordance with its constitution then absolutely if people won't get on board they can be asked to leave the party i get that and that was my understanding of what the judgment said. But if you're going to kick people out of a political party, the process has got to be fair. And Article 10, you know, freedom of speech is then going to come into it. I mean, is the Green Party saying, I think it must be, that no kind of criticism or discussion whatsoever can ever be made of the Green Party's declaration that men can become women? Now, that's going to be a difficult one to defend, isn't it? Because it's not the same as attacking an ecological policy. It, it, it's nebulous. It's it's some sort of construct of, of gender ideology and gender studies. And there has to be some room for exploration and discussion. So I think where the Green Party is going to fall down is in holding people to this absolute standard I think they do run a very serious risk of being discriminatory if they don't allow any discussion or any dissent, even though, of course, as a political party, they are entitled to set the parameters of their party and their engagement. So it's not the same as a university, because obviously in a university, I think it should be really anything goes. As long as you're not inciting murder, um, you should be allowed to say and debate and discuss anything. Political parties, of course, can put limits on what people are allowed to say, because yeah, you've all got to pull together, roughly, haven't you, for a party to achieve any of its gains. If it's just a complete free-for-all and nobody really knows what the policy is and people aren't pulling in the same direction. But it's so interesting that the Green Party have decided to hitch its wagon to this star. I think it will be the end of them. I think the Green Party will be facing bankruptcy. If all the other cases that you've mentioned go forward and they win, because... It, and it's such a shame, isn't it? Because what other party is putting the environment um, foremost and central? Well, none of them. That was the whole aim of the Green Party, as I naively understood yeah. it. So it's, I think you're absolutely right to draw people's attention to, say, the Rheindorf report, because that makes the absolutely crucial point, is that people have been following what Stonewall tell them is the law, and Stonewall are wrong, and deliberately so because they have been trying for decades to insert gender identity as the protected characteristic when it is not. So, yeah, no, definitely, if, if the Green Party is saying we don't have to worry about the Joe Phoenix case or the Ryan Dorff report because we're not a university, that's incredibly short-sighted. These general principles of non-discrimination and the importance of freedom of speech apply to 
everybody, sorry, every public or quasi-public body, obviously you can't sue an individual, but, you know, the Green Party is an association. It's certainly covered by the Equality Act. And that was how Sharar was able to bring his case and how all the others are going to be able to bring their case. So, yeah, I, I think you'll definitely just keep hammering them in any way that you can, because it's these general principles they've lost sight of. Absolutely, isn't it? The general principle enshrined by Article 10 of the European Convention. They're just Well, I think, um, yeah, let's let's take a little wander down that route, because um, I think... One of the things that seems to me quite interesting, and now I've been a party mm -hmm. member for 17 years, and um, we've obviously had a bit of a change in the last, I'd say, seven to ten years, maybe seven years, where things have got much more fractious and difficult. Um, and I am, as I've said previously, a local councillor. Now, one of the things I understood about the party and one of the things that I think we use as our special USP when we're talking about why we're different to Labour, why we're different to the Liberals and why we're different to the Tories, is that we are not whipped. You know, Greens are not whipped. Now, I haven't been particularly interested in the whipping side of things until quite recently when it suddenly, with, with all this discussion about what we can and can't do, I, I went back to our policies now, our policies are not really policies, and I'm not sure that Judge Hellman had really had time to look at that. There, there are a lot of statements tied together. They're not what I call a proper policy that actually sets out what we might or might not do. Um, but one of them, tucked away in local, local administration or something, talks about how we don't whip because we don't want secret, we don't think that secret meetings and holding people to a secret that boat behind closed doors is acceptable, so we won't do it. So I think that's the root of why we don't do it. But um, having this idea that we don't whip and then at the same time saying, but you must keep to these certain particular policies which we've chosen. Again, I was looking at our policy lexicon this afternoon for my sins. There are thousands and thousands of separate different policy items. And as someone mm. who's been in the party for 17 years, I know some of them, but not the one, for example, that says, we think regarding population that everyone should have the right to have as many children as they want. Yeah. So that's one that I've not thought about before. But if we had some discussion to say, well, maybe in the future we might have to restrict. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's difficult things to be talked about there. And it seems to me bizarre that a party that wants to talk about being tolerant and liberal and um, having decisions made at the lowest possible level and a kind of very open system really then and, and that's why we don't whip and why we're so special and different then suddenly has this new thing that's come into being which says but on these certain issues we will whip using the complaint system we will whip very very hard and you could argue i suppose that what's happened in the the, the spokesperson arrangement is that we have decided that we can do some whipping of a certain sort to spokespeople or to leaders because we've now realised that as we become a slightly more mature party that we have to have some way of keeping discipline. And I think it's a problem with the um, the youth of the party in a way and the naivety of entering local government or entering parliament and not understanding that you need a way to control what people say. But we haven't fully thought it through and nobody's really talking about the fact that we don't whip or when people are allowed to have conscience. Because there's also something, isn't there, in political parties about conscience that says that you know, even if we've made it a central plank, which I don't think we have, actually, I think just a, a very loud certain part of our party is trying mm. to make it be that way. I think if we were to go further down that route and go to take it to court, a free speech, you know, what is free speech in the Green Party to court? Yeah. That they might find that they're tripping over their own rules and their own stuff that mm. they've put in place. So I think um, there's more to discuss on that one um, and um, not necessarily that they can they can chuck anybody out that they want because they don't agree. Because it's a nonsense, isn't it, to say that in politics you can't argue for change. Political mm. change is mm. all about policy change all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's I mean, it, it goes back to what I was saying, that there's this assumption that any criticism at all of gender identity ideology is wrong, inherently wicked and bigoted, akin to the most foul racism. That's what seems to be informing this. I mean, yeah, there, there have to be matters of conscience. I think um, the capital punishment is a very obvious one, isn't it, for MPs? They are always permitted to vote according to their own conscience. I think, yeah, there's a lot to unpick there, isn't there? If the Green Party haven't made this a central plank, 
then you're right, they've been hijacked by a particular minority. And I think it's interesting you mention the younger members, because I think a lot of this is indicative, frankly, of immaturity. Their brains have not developed. This very black and white, concrete, binary thinking, you're with us or you're against us. And I was just the same in my early 20s. And you grow up and you realise things are more complicated than that. And people can hold views different to yours and still be reasonable people. So, yeah, that I think we'd have to drill down. Just what actually is the status of this belief that you can change sex? Is this something now which you will be whipped into supporting because it's so fundamental to the Green Party? I mean, that in itself is a big discussion, isn't it? I still do not understand why a general support for inclusion and diversity, which is great, and obviously every institution should be behind that, that general commitment to something that's good has narrowed into a very specific commitment to something that is actually exclusionary and harmful. So I think that's po probably where the impact of the Green Party should be. Look, what exactly is going on with this? She's saying there's no discussion, there's no deviation, not ever. Well, why? How? How did this come to be? Who yeah. voted for it? Was it within procedures? Because it is going to hurt the Green Party. I was telling you before we started about my experience. I got cold called by the Green Party saying, oh, would you like to come and do some local activism? And I said, well, no. And here's why. I don't even think I'm a member of the Green Party anymore. If I am, you'll probably want to suspend me, won't you? Because I do not sign up to what appears to be your central organising principle that men can become women. And he was initially a bit defensive and said, oh, no, we've drawn a line under that. We've made our decision where we stand. There's no need to discuss it anymore. And I said, well, I'm telling you there is, because I'm telling you now why I won't be canvassing or campaigning for the Green Party. And I cannot be the only woman who thinks this way. And he was really nice. And he said, oh, well, take your comments on board. I'll report back. Obviously, I never heard anything further. But this is the danger, isn't it? The party will eat itself from within. You'll have all this internal fighting from the people who are really committed and you'll lose all the ordinary people like me who joined up because the other party seemed so poisonous. I thought, where else do I go? Oh, let's give the Green Party a go. So it, it will just destroy itself from the inside and from the outside if this isn't dealt with. And I think maybe that's another central message from tonight, not just about training. I think that would be really good, but just sorting out at the highest level what the bloody hell are you trying to achieve by telling people that they may not ever discuss something as nebulous, something as unsupported and unscientific as this declaration that men can become, become women and women can become, become men because they can't. Mm. And that's just the reality. It is very frustrating that we have to talk about it in terms of a belief. But that was how we got under the umbrella of the Protection of the Equality Act. It's not a belief. It's a fact. Every single person on this call came from a woman. It, it drives me utterly insane that people yeah. are denying the existence of sex. So really, yeah, for those of you actually involved with the Green Party internally, this has got to be sorted out. For a party that doesn't whip... Why are you whipping on this one well, issue? Well, yes, it is, I think, a really important question, which we will, as um, a group and further on, have to talk about more. I mean, it can get a bit technical with people. So are you popping in there to say something or are you to come on I'm, screen? I'm here to, to point you towards members' questions, some of which might be um, appropriate right now, because there yeah. is a question really around, obviously, Sharar was uh, removed as a spokesperson. He wasn't removed. He wasn't suspended from the party. He was just removed as a spokesperson. And it was the spokesperson's code of conduct that was that he was held up against. But of course, it was procedural unfairness that um, that he was at, that was seen to be discriminatory against him. Uh, it's because they didn't follow the processes, as we've talked about in all of these other cases. I think a lot of people really want to know where ordinary members stand, because Shiraz's case was very particular. And there's that difference and that distinction between um, the spokesperson's code of conduct, which might restrict freedom of speech more than ordinary members within the party. Um, and, and thanks, you can, I just want to direct 
people that might not have been looking to the chat there's loads of fantastic links that have been put up and there was also an extract that emma just put up earlier about um the green party ordinary members code of conduct which says that you've got freedom of expression members have a right to freedom of thought conscience belief and that should be respected uh, I just wondered if you guys have any thoughts around this impact yeah. of the members, really. Okay, let's go there. I think that's a really useful way to, to look at things. And, mm -hmm. and let's look at where you are there, Zoe. You've got your Green Women's Declaration behind your head. Now, we, we those of us who signed the original um, declaration, were part of the reason was, of course, to test this, isn't it? that we believe that as ordinary members, it's not a central plank. And we believe that the things in our declaration are things that we can stand by as Green Party members. And in a way, it's a kind of test, isn't it? It says, if it really is such a central plank, and there's a thousand of us who've signed, what are you going to do about it? And I think part of what we're talking about here is, as we all get the ability to speak out more, and let's not forget that this has been very difficult inside the party because we've all been threatened for so long and, and cowed and, and made to feel that we shouldn't talk about it, that we are actually testing the waters by even having this meeting tonight, by associating with, with you know, views that we perhaps aren't allowed to have. Now, I think it's interesting that since we signed the declaration and published it, there has been no communication from anyone in head office Nobody has asked us to stop. Nobody has asked me to stop. Nobody has said you shouldn't have that declaration. So it seems to me that there is a kind of uneasy, well, not uneasy, they're going, we know that really we can't do this. What do you think, Sarah? Well, it goes back to exactly to my conversation with the bloke who Cole called me. I said, I'm not sure if I'm still a member of the Green Party. I think I cancelled my subs. But could I be? Would I be? still allowed to be a member of the Green Party when there's absolutely no doubt my absolute contempt for that position that gender identity ideology ought to be given much of any respect and I'm not sure where we went with that conversation I think he said oh you'd still be a very valued member of the party which was interesting but let's be real I know sure I was was done for code of conduct breaches as a spokesperson, but I read the attacks on him, which are contained in the judgment. They are horrific. Sean Berry tweeting all sorts of nonsense. That group saying he was essentially bigoted and, and hideous. How is that not going to filter down to ordinary members? If that's the message you're getting from on high, that all right, have your disgusting, grubby little beliefs, but you can't ever have any position of power authority in this party. I imagine my life would not be very pleasant if I went along to some sort of Green Party conference wearing my suffragette colours and with a T-shirt saying adult human female. I, I don't think we can get too hung up on, well, it was a specific position with a specific code of conduct, because this attitude, again, I repeat, people believe that any criticism or challenge to gender identity ideology is an act of horrendous bigotry and that surely is going to cascade down to the ordinary members presumably they haven't made a big fuss about it now because they're worried about how many ordinary members they'd actually have to suspend there yeah. must be quite a lot i mean you're the green party for sake you know as as you believe in material reality the environment around you you believe in science I mean, I would be gobsmacked if the majority of ordinary Green Party members were not, on some level, gender critical. So what is the party going to do? Kick them all out? I mean, I, it, you've got to reconcile what was done to Shara as a particular post within the party has implications for every single member, and they will have to own that. You cannot call somebody disgusting and bigoted for holding particular views and say oh we're just confining it to this particular post no no it, it's obviously much wider and deeper than that isn't it so i think it's a really interesting question i didn't get an answer well i suppose i did he did say no no you'd still be a valued member of the party and i thought well that is quite interesting isn't it even though i've made it very clear i reject absolutely your position on gender identity i think i think it's clear to most people who are on the fringes of this let's say you know like campaigning in local parties and I know it was one of the questions that Zoe's got on her list saying I'm a, I'm a local activist and I do loads of good work and all the rest of it you know are they going to come and kick me out and I think we know that the answer to that is no they're not they would like us all to keep on doing the work and delivering the leaflets and doing all the stuff as long as we keep quiet which I think increasingly people aren't going to do um, and for a membership organisation 
that relies solely on subscriptions, really, and donations. It's a very, very strange kind of way to, to have a business plan, isn't it, that says you're going to alienate possibly half your party who are women, you know, yeah. a great a great proportion of them, and then the older people, and then the disabled people, and then probably your, your, your kind of greens of colour, which they don't all agree as well. So I think they are going to have to think about it very carefully. I think part of the problem is there, haven't, there hasn't been a will to think about it, and there still isn't. So even with the case, the judgment that we've seen, there's been no kind of oh, we must have a rethink or maybe we should think about it. They'd be very, very quiet. It's noticeable, that actually, I have to say. Um, yeah. Uh, there was something else that Zoe was uh, was was telling me in a, in a side message here on WhatsApp, which was, let's can we just talk a little bit about Stonewall? I know one other thing that Shirar tried many, many times over the years and probably will try again at the next conference is to get us to disaffiliate from Stonewall. Oh, um, yeah. We've been affiliated for years. Do you think we should? I mean, I know the answer to this myself, but, you know, we really need to stop giving the money, especially as apparently we've got no money of our own. Stonewall is a dangerous and now I would say quasi-criminal operation. You must disassociate from it. Stonewall is probably the biggest driver of all of this. And as that includes the medical transition of children, I think that they are an extremely dangerous organisation. And as I think w was made very clear by Liz Truss a number of years ago now, no government department should be affiliated with it. You've got the, the Nolan report, which made very clear the absolutely hideous impact it had on the BBC. Stonewall and its ilk are a direct threat to our democracy. No political party should be affiliated with them, none. So I think that's absolutely crucial. They are pushing things which are not the law, which is having a direct and harmful impact on women and children. And I, I feel very strongly about this. And I hope to God Alison Bailey wins her appeal, because I think that would be a very interesting nail in their coffin. And I think that's coming up in March, isn't it? They, mm. without a doubt in my mind, attempted to influence her chambers to kicking her out. They are very dangerous indeed so yes please green party and i'd like to see what the reaction is to that but i think that well, is another essential yeah. plank of the fight back isn't it but we've got to have something else to offer though haven't we stonewall have been offering a, 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 a rope a way out of all the confusion we'll come and train you we'll tell you what you need to yeah. do and people do need that equality diversity discrimination law it's complicated so I think get rid of Stonewall and put something in place that's actually committed to a proper and effective understanding of the actual law. And that will be a really, really positive thing. Yeah. And here and here, I think we have um, one of the issues that we've got inside our own party and our own governance to get back to you know, the title of what we're talking about. So we, we said it was governance, policy um, and, and law. Now. I've spent far too much time looking at our governance in the last year and a bit and um, not something that I've been particularly interested in. I was busy being a councillor over in Bristol, just, you know, dealing with bins and recycling and people wanting help with their housing. I kind of got dragged into this because um, of the expel motion where one of my colleagues here in Bristol put a motion into conference that said, if you sign the Women's Declaration, you're an evil, horrible, bigoted person, fascist, you know, whatever, and you should be kicked out of the party. So that's what kicked me into play but since then looking at the governance and trying to understand more about what the problems are for the party and linking it into the phoenix judgment which is of course the universities are full of gender ideology and we shouldn't be able to talk about free speech is that we've got in positions of authority and governance lots and lots of very young recently graduated from university um members who don't have a wealth of experience, who were trained by Stonewall somehow. And I'd say an over, um, over, they're overly represented in all our governance bodies. I mean, you could argue maybe it's because we've been so successful at getting councillors in, 500, 700 councillors. They step into local government and then leave a void inside our own internal governance that quickly gets populated by very young, young Greens and, and people in their early 20s, 30s. So we've kind of, made the problem ourselves actually um i'm not sure what the solution is for it although one of them is for, for older and wiser heads to step up and for the training to happen but um are there any other thoughts about how a, an organization of our size can get out of this sort of problem because you're right part of what it is is people in these positions of power do think we should just automatically be expelled or being put in suspension or punished is just a given 
Um, so mm-hmm. how do we get ourselves mm-hmm. out of this mess? It's very difficult, isn't it? Because Stonewall has effectively captured a generation. Add to that the fact we know our brains, our cognition is not fully developed till we're about 25. And so that sort of dangerous black and white thinking and the zealotry of youth. I mean, it can be very appealing. It can be very effective, but it's also very dangerous. So uh, all I can think is we go back to the central planks. We've got to get proper training in. People have got to understand what the law is. They've got to understand what discrimination actually is and that they are guilty of it just because they feel they are righteous. If they cannot deal with a plurality of views, then maybe they should think about going and doing something else. It's just it's hammering home that message, which I think does take maturity and life experience to fully get on board. I mean, I'm embarrassed, as I'm sure we all are, with some of the things we said and did in our late teens and early 20s. We're not formed. We don't have that ability to entertain and sit with nuance and difficulty. But I think as long as we recognise that's probably part of the problem, that's this generation's coming up, you've been completely inculcated by Stonewall, TikTok, social media, I mean, all of that. Just being alive to that and trying in the kindest way possible to lead them through it until their brains have sufficiently developed that they can cope with more than one opinion at a time. It, it is, I think, essentially a question of maturity. And sadly, you know, some people can be in their 50s and 60s and still be incredibly immature about this. It is about plurality of views. We, we, we seem to be becoming so unable to accept it. And I do wonder the role that social media has played in that, because obviously it does strip away tone and nuance. And say all my discussions on Twitter today, for example, have been completely polarised about my use of pronouns. And it's just been so tiring and so exasperating. You know, while a single child is still facing medical transition, we can't be wasting our time like this. But it seems that social media, I think, has has had an impact on how we engage, even on how we think. Mm. And it's become very, very polarised. It's it, going to be it, difficult. It certainly but... has. And I think one of the things that's interesting, if, like me, you spend a lot of time looking at our overly complex governance documents. And I have to say, one of the things as a Green Party member that I find quite shocking now is that we've made something that is essentially quite simple really quite complex our documentation is like as you said in the trial it's like so difficult to work out what's going on yeah. i've been in the party a long time i've been on governance bodies you know i i know I, I know the leaders and i've spoken with them and i i know a great deal about how the party works and i still find it really quite um, quite difficult mm. so i think that's designed into the system to make it difficult um yeah. and then yeah. kind of adding in young and experienced people and you know you you've got a hot mess you just mentioned pronouns i if you've got if you've got the will we could go there because that is an issue in the party as well um the party <laughs> likes to say that we you know it, we mustn't misgender people um is that or is that something that the party can kind of um legally say to us or not no you i mean, go there? i don't I don't think it can. I mean, it was Fair Cop and Keep Prison Single Sex recently commissioned an advice from a KC, I don't know if you were following that, about the transgender police officers searching women. And the KC confirmed that the guidance wasn't lawful, but it would be lawful if the male police officer had a GRC. And Maya from Sex Matters wrote a very good response to that, going, this is ridiculous. You can't force individuals to comply with somebody else's view of their gender identity. Now, what the EAT said in Maya's case, misgendering, if persistent and gratuitous, could be victimisation harassment. If you go up to somebody's desk, you work with them and you say, you're a man, you're a man, you're a man, 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 you know, shouting in their ear. That that's going to be harassment, but that's, I don't think, anything to do with pronouns. It's to do with you being in their space and being hostile to them. I think we've got to stop treating pronouns like they are magic. We've got to take the sting out of misgendering. People ought to be allowed to use whatever pronouns they feel comfortable with, because we cannot be compelled to believe what other people do. I will be polite to religious people, but I'm not going to be forced to worship with them. I'm not going to agree with them that their God is real. So I think provided you're not shouting in someone's ear or following them home, you ought to be at perfect liberty to use the pronouns that you think are acceptable. And I do think that pronouns have become some sort of 
shibboleth for people. They, they, it, they've taken on an importance they do not have. Pronouns do not create or confer sex. I appreciate it can be very confusing when, for example, The Guardian reports that a woman followed a man around in Oxford and murdered him. And nowhere in that article would you know this was actually a man. I mean, I thought my solution was a good one. When I was talking about the unresignation of Victoria McLeod, I said, Victoria McLeod is a man who's adopted a female gender identity. Out of courtesy, I will use female pronouns. And I said that because I wanted people to read my article, not to simply dismiss me as a flaming bigot. Now, my reward for that has been essentially to be called a liar, an idiot, stupid, disappointing, um, and that people shouldn't read my article because it was so inherently confusing. And I'm sorry, but grow up. I said in the first paragraph, Victoria McLeod is a man. There is only one way to become a woman, be born female and live beyond 18 years. If you really cannot cope thereafter with me using a female pronoun, that's not my problem. That I think this goes back to what I said about the downsides of social media, that people have to adopt a very negative and polarising position that simply seems to be what these platforms force us to do. And I apologise to everyone who was trying to be more nuanced and reasonable. And I probably blocked you just out of exasperation and lumped you in with all the people who are being rude. But um, pronouns just... are a symptom. They're not a cause. If we can sort the law out and get people to understand it's not possible to change sex, I don't care what men want to be called. It won't change their sex. It won't make them women. I appreciate other people have a different idea, but going back to your original question, no, I don't see that any individual can be forced to essentially adopt the religious belief of another. And I think believing that you can change sex is a, is a quasi-religious belief. So I'll just carry on with this because this is something that does permeate through our complaint system and through our local parties, I think, and, and it keeps people very um, quiet, actually, a lot of the time. I see it in my own party, I have to say. Um, now there's a kind of there's a kind of thing that goes on that says because we're greens and we've agreed with our code of conduct that we will be nice and we will think the best of people and we will not upset people or do them harm you know i don't think it actually i've been through the policies i don't think there's anywhere that says do them harm but there's this inherent idea isn't there that somehow if i don't use someone's pronouns that I'm doing them harm and therefore I can be pulled up on the code of conduct and therefore I can be suspended and punished. So you're not sure that that wouldn't stand up in any kind of courtroom. The that problem you that you've just identified is misgendering has been characterised as akin to genocide. And we know I'm not sadly mm. exaggerating. We need to put gender identity back in its box. Being misgendered does not harm you. It does not. These people need to be told with the greatest respect to grow up. You cannot change sex. You can present in whichever way you like. And if you're nice about it, then I will be courteous to you. There are some yep. people I would feel. I mean, I give the example. Um, if I had a very distressed trans identifying teenage client, I'm not going to sit down in front of them and go, oh, jolly well, buck up, daddy. You'll always be a boy. Nothing, nothing you can do about it. I would make a decision to speak to that client using the language I thought was appropriate at that time if they were distressed. So I would probably go by preferred pronouns, preferred names. This does not mean I think the person in front of me has changed sex. This does not mean I think it is healthy for them to be allowed to think that. This does not mean that misgendering them is an automatic harm. It's just in certain circumstances, I probably would because I don't give pronouns this magical power that some people seem to ascribe them in the same way I don't believe photographs take part of your soul. But that's what we've got to do. Pronouns are the symptom, not the cause. If we can get gender identity back in its box, then people will be a lot less worried. And I appreciate, although I probably haven't shown this on Twitter, let my exasperation get the better of me, I appreciate people are generally worried, frightened and angry. And when things like that Guardian article come along, you can see why. You would not have known that was a man from the Guardian yeah. article. You were led to believe that a woman went out hunting for a man to kill. That doesn't happen for obvious reasons. And I was very angry about that. So I can quite see why people have got justifiable anger. But it goes back to the training, doesn't it? 
we have to put gender identity back in its box. Being misgendered is not genocide. It's not going to harm you. Somebody being really nasty to you will harm you. I go back to my example. If someone follows you around the office going, huh, you're a bloke, you're a bloke. Oh, look at you, you blokey bloke. That's shitty behavior. But not because you're misgendering, because you're being a dick. And that's what I think we have to be able to understand and put into proportion. I mean, for example, Robin White. I will not ever use female pronouns with Robin White because he has used up every last ounce of my compassion and my courtesy. He does not deserve any of that. And he's probably been instrumental in doing so much harm. His finger is in every one of these pies, isn't it? Mm, um, yeah. But if some people want to call him she, I'm not going to get my knickers in a twist because the use of the pronoun does not change what we know to be true that Robin White is male, will always be male, but wishes for reasons unknown to known only to himself, wishes to present as female. And that's not going to hurt any of us, provided that we can have the proper recognition and protection for sex as an organising category. Robin may wear a skirt and be called she, but there are some places Robin will not be allowed to go, such as counselling for female victims of male sexual violence. And because, you know, Robin's voice immediately indicates Robin's male status. And that would be, I think, very triggering and upsetting for women. But in most situations, sex is irrelevant, isn't it? Mm. If we just, you know, meet in the pub, if I am Robin's opponent in a case, I don't care what sex he is. It's not relevant. But when it is relevant, it's really, really relevant. Sorry, that's probably a long and rambling answer. But no, no, I, think, I, think I do not think... I think we've got to stand up to this misgendering thing. It is not automatically harmful to someone to be misgendered. Yeah. That's so, the bottom line. Thank you both. This, is, this is brilliant. And I'm just going to do a little quick chime check. Um, we are at 10 past nine. We're due to finish at half past nine. Um, Jude, are you a, are you, do you want to carry on any more with that? Or do you want to go to a couple more questions before? Let's, let's have a couple more questions. I'm just going to say one thing because in case, just in case the CEO of the Green Party does watch this back at some point, which I really hope she will, and we've had some communication about how she feels she must balance our safe spaces policy with all the rest of what we're talking about, um, is that safe spaces are not necessarily what she thinks they are and just just to what Sarah said, that we, we don't need to have safe spaces where we're not allowed to talk about things. And that's the most important thing. So, you know, that's for Mary Clegg. If you're watching this, we could have a longer chat about it sometime, please. Go on then, Zoe. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody who has sent in so many questions. We've had so many and there's so much that we could talk about on each of the topics that we've opened up this evening. We're not going to get through everyone's questions, so apologies for that in advance. But I've grouped, through, uh, grouped together three which have got some sort of similarities and they're around discrimination and the law. Um, we've got one in from Audrey Ludwig who says she's got a question about the status of queer phobia guidance, which some members seem to think is part of policy. It wasn't mentioned in the Shara Ali judgment, that's because it hadn't come into play at that time. But my view is that it could amount to unlawful harassment against gender critical members. So there's that. There's another question about um, harassment and discrimination, sorry, discrimination of uh, gender critical members. And they ask, would it be wholesale discrimination if it could be shown that complaints against gender critical members receive more serious treatment than the complaints about other issues? So would this be on the basis of sexism? So we're finding a lot of women that are being sanctioned more harshly when they are um, having complaints made against them and they hold gender critical views. So would that amount to discrimination? And then the final question in this grouping is, is there any scope for a joint legal action by members against the party? Do such things exist in British law? Wow, tricky ones. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll preface it with a disclaimer. I am not a discrimination or employment law specialist. I have read every single judgment. I've tried to puzzle things out. I think I have a reasonably good grasp, but I'm not a specialist and I cannot give legal advice about any of this. For what it's worth, I think that there would be both sex discrimination and belief discrimination for gender critical women. So that's worth looking at. I'm not sure what is meant by action by the members against the party. I mean, that, I'm not sure how that would work. But again, that's not my area because you'd have to prove discrimination against an individual, not just sort of some nebulous 
concept. So, yeah, a whole load of individuals could band together, couldn't they, and say we've all been treated in the same despicable way. And that's, I mean, group actions are permitted, aren't they? It's a more efficient way sometimes of litigating. But you'd need to go and get some very specialist legal advice on that. And I'm sorry you won't get it from me. But, the, but those are my thoughts. There was an, the queer phobia thing, which you may not have um, a great knowledge of, Sarah, but I mean, I'll just give mm. you a rundown that one of our government's bodies, which is um, effectively run by young people um, with, uh, <laughs> with um, education from major universities, has written a, what you would call a queer phobia guidance. Um, and it's just basically you know you can't talk about sex you can't talk about anything it's it's one of those you can imagine it's it's three pages long and it just basically says well if you, th this is what, very much jonathan hate and the coddling of the american mind territory yes, isn't it? yes linking to what you say about sa safe spaces it's because the universities were the first places to be infected with this kind of thinking and now it's spreading to the wider world as the young people graduate. And obviously it was hoped that everyone would laugh at them when they left college and they wouldn't get jobs. Uh, no, they did. And that's why it's infected the workplaces because they've come from universities. I mean, I think there is definitely a pushback against this. People are getting fed up. It is a nonsense. I'm sorry. Part of being in the world means you are going to have to hear things you profoundly dislike, profoundly disagree with. And if that is a psychological problem for you, go and get help. You cannot ask all the people around you to change their behaviour to protect you. So again, this is one of the fundamental things we need to fight back about, which is why I think proper training is needed, particularly but in a political party. Do you think then, and, and this document is quite long and it basically says, you know, all these things and it's been put into our framework of, of ethics and governance and it's been placed there deliberately to kind of be this ticking time bomb to make sure that, that for example, the elders who've been suspended recently, one of them was, mm. you've broken the queer phobia guidance. Now, they're just going to set off so many, um, that will never stand up in court, will it? Uh, but in the meantime, it's being used as a stick to beat people with. Yeah, exactly. What about the middle-aged women phobia guidance? I mean, this, this is ridiculous. You either pander to absolutely every minority view or you don't pander to any you just have right. basic rules of courtesy and fairness of course i do not think these people should be abused or harassed for what i think are their ridiculous views but i ought to be able to say i think your views are ridiculous this is why you tell me why i'm wrong have a discussion about it that kind of robust exchange has to be permitted otherwise democracy is dead it's very, very worrying that a political party is setting up these untouchable principles, which are inherently discriminatory. And you, know, you said that that couldn't possibly, I think, survive a challenge. No. If an older woman was booted out of the party or her progress within the party was halted because she had offended against the queer phobia policy. Well, and, you're um, just looking at another discrimination action, aren't you? So, and um, just again, because this is a direct question that I've asked our chief executive officer, and our governance officer, whose job inside a membership organisation like this with paid staff, I mean, our CEO is paid a substantial amount of money and our governance officer is paid, you know, 50, 60 grand. Mm -hmm. Is that their role to kind of make sure that these things aren't inserted or as a volunteer-led organisation? If, if, if they're being paid to oversee equality, diversity and inclusion, then that has to mean what it says on the tin, doesn't it? At yeah. the moment, what we are seeing is exclusion and a lack of diversity because one particular minority view about the way we organise society, about what's acceptable in terms of sexuality and gender identity is being given supremacy and is not allowed to be challenged. And that is the very essence of exclusion and discrimination. But because Stonewall and Mermaids, etc., have been so successful, and going back right to what I said at the beginning, these people think they are morally righteous. They don't think they've just got a viewpoint. They think that they have uncovered the moral foundation of the, our very existence. They are wrong. And part of that is just the natural naivety of youth. Some of them are very malicious. And I think they're just delighted to have a stick to beat women with. 
particularly old, disgusting, middle-aged women. And, and some are just confused and trying to do the right thing. But absolutely. If you've got the money to pay someone 50, 60 grand a year to oversee this, they need to do their jobs. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. And, and I hope, again, that certain leaders in the party watch this because it is something that I've been saying for quite a long time. And sometimes I feel like, you know, we're just not, we're obviously not being listened to. And um, maybe. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we will get listened to. Have you got another question, Zoe? Your last, you know, your last hurrah. I was just, I'm just going to read out some examples from the queer phobia guidance for you. Oh. Treat. It says that transphobic yeah. behaviour, of which you can be sanctioned for, typically includes actions which convey a view that trans women are not real women, are men, and or are male people. Trans men are not real men. They or trans men are women and or are female people and or i mean it makes a load of sense doesn't it already non-binary genders and identities do not exist or are invalid so if you say any of those things that's it yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we we are up against it somewhat i feel um yes yeah, yeah but those those they cannot survive legal challenge. I think the big issue facing us is whether we can find another way that law fair, because I do worry we are running out of energy and money. But this sort of nonsense would not survive a legal challenge now. And the Green Party needs to understand and accept that. But of course, we need a stick to beat them with if they're not going to change. At the moment, it seems the EHRC are utterly ineffective and toothless. The government's outsourced it. Our only response is lawfare, I'm afraid. Yeah, that seems to be what we're left with. So that's possibly a place to kind of um, work our way out of here. So just to say that we have probably... Um, on the on the zoom here tonight um you know we've got emma who is using lawfare to try and take um, the party to court we've got dawn who's using lawfare we've had shara whose case was using lawfare and was was very successful thank you very much again for taking that bringing that case Shara. i think you're still on the call um and um, what what would be your advice to anyone else in the party you might be thinking you know do you think it's still, I know you've talked about this before, but, you know, we're going to exhaust the possibilities, but it's still got to happen. I mean, one of the things I said at Philia, actually, last year is that it seems to be that the party is intent on being the party that just, you know, uses lawfare the wrong way around, if you see what I mean, to, to prove uh, how, how bad we are at all this all the time. <laughs> oh, and, and we're going to link Emma's and Dawn's crowdfunders at the end. They're in the chat. That's just to say, you know, I wanted to make sure we talk about it. Yeah, there's lots, there's lots of uh, links in the chat, but yeah, please do take a look at Emma and um, Emma and Dawn's crowdfunders. Anybody who wants to support us, and I think if I can just do a little plug then for for the Green Women's Declaration and say that oh, you know we're working hard on this issue within the party um, all the time, but we would love to have some more support from members here. So if you have uh, been watching, uh, whether you're interested, you don't actually have to be a Green Party member or not. If you want to support us, then please do join our mailing list, um, get in touch with us and say, you know, talk about, um, it, say, tell us that you're interested, drop us an email. We're going to have all those links coming up in the chat as well. Make sure that you've joined our email list. Um, and there's a, a number of other things that you could do, one of which is donating to us. Um, the, the resources that we have to put on these sort of webinars, we have to always make them big because they always seem to be a sellout which is fantastic so um, each of those events costs money um, so if you can help us out in that way that would be fantastic Jude I realized that I didn't give you a proper intro at the beginning of the meeting but you've done a fantastic and sterling job Jude is the newly elected co-chair of Green Party Women now, if um, uh, if anything is, uh, you know, if history is anything to go by, the last three gender critical um, co-chairs of Green Party Women have been suspended before the end of their term of office. So absolutely <laughs> good luck to you. And that's what happened to me. That's what happened to Dawn. Well, that's what happened to Emma. Thank so you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I mean, just uh, I'm coming up to the anniversary of the first time I communicated with the CEO, actually. And it's interesting that in that document, I wrote my gender critical views down. and I asked them to be put on my membership and I you know kind of set up a little you know hopefully a little defense that says you know you can't do any of this to me so i'm, I'm hoping to be one of the gender critical um, green party women co-chairs that makes it through a whole year that is my aspiration <laughs> by, uh, using my my intelligence and knowledge of the law and it's been really lovely to listen to you sarah and help help us through some of this difficult tricky stuff i have to say 
I don't know how many people are on this call, but one of the things I think is really important is that more of us in the party start to understand our our rights and our responsibilities to use part of our own policy lexicon. And just to go back to the last time that Zoe, Sarah and I were in a room together was here in Bristol, where you gave a really fantastic talk, Sarah, on access to justice, where you talked about how difficult it is for women particularly to access the justice system, not particularly to do with this, but it does include it. Um, but also that um, we we really need to be made aware of what is happening to us. Joe Phoenix stood up and said, you know, even as a very intelligent, well-educated professor inside a university, it took quite a long time for her to realise how she was being treated illegally mm -hmm. and discriminated against. And I think I would speak to the whole Zoom room here to say that if you feel in the party that you are being discriminated against in the party, you probably are. And we all need to start to talk about it. That's why we wanted to do this um, webinar. It's why we've been doing the two ones before, why we'll continue to do it and why Green Party women will continue to speak out and challenge the party where they we know they are doing wrong. And we know they're doing wrong all over the place. So it's a big job. I'm really pleased, Sarah, that you're still in the party. I think it would do the party good to know that you're here. It's a shame in a way that they don't um, ask any of us women for help, isn't it? Maybe the time is coming near. Um, but I'll stop there. Go on, Zoe. Um, yeah, I was just going to say absolutely another reason for the existence of the Green Women's Declaration as well as campaigning for policy change is absolutely to uh, provide support to those people who are being feeling bullied or feeling like they are being sidelined. So please do reach out to us as well if that if that feels like it's you. Don't feel like you have to fight this on your own because you absolutely don't. There's a really strong network of women uh, with male allies now that are, uh, are understanding what our legal position is and understanding that when we share knowledge and information and when we stand together we are much stronger so we don't have to be in isolation so you know it's an absolutely plea to not only help us but also um, let us know if you're suffering um, I just want to then wrap up this evening uh, by saying thank you so much Sarah and thank you so much Jude to what's been a fantastic uh, and insightful evening um, it's been wonderful to see all of the chat going on in the zoom I'm sorry that we haven't had a chance as I say to uh, speak to everybody and hear everybody's uh, thoughts and views but we will make sure that our speakers get to hear and see everything that's been mentioned and we'll be looking through and taking on all of the comments on board I know some of the opinions that have been expressed this evening haven't aligned with your views and that's great <laughs> We're really pleased that you have come with different views, different thoughts and different ideas. That's exactly what we want. We want this debate to stay alive and we want it to continue. It's a really, really important issue. Sarah, are there any other last words that you want to share with us before we say goodnight? Um, just an echo of what you said. The good thing about what's happened is that we have organised and there is now a fantastic network of knowledge tapping into available solicitors. I think when Maya, for example, first started, it was very difficult for her to find someone to take on her case. That is no longer the case. So, yeah, w women are socialised to be accommodating and nice. If you feel you're being discriminated against, there's now a wealth of resources and people who can help you. So use them. I do think we are going to have to keep using lawfare for a little while longer. So let's go for it. Thank you so much then. Well, that's it. Then we're going to close the meeting unless you're a, an organiser of the event, uh, in which case stay on if you're an organiser of the event. Otherwise, we'll say good night and thank you very much.